Hey guys, I'm Eddie, and in today's Journal Clubish, I'm going to be talking about the arrest trial. I like all these sexy names for trials because it helps you kind of remember it, but how they derive it is always kind of interesting because like for example, the A in arrest is from the adjunctive, the R is from ornithamposin, the other R is all the way in the aureus, at least I think this is how it is, the E is also from the aureus, the S is also at the end of the aureus, and uh, the T is from the, oh, Right? Is our, uh, yeah, and then the T is in the bacteremia. So it's kind of cool how they did that. Um, it's always cool to have a sexy name because, like, that you'll remember the name of the trial. So the title of the study, the arrest trial, is Adjunctive Rifampicin, and yes, I'm reading it off my computer screen, for Staphylococcus aureus bacteremia. And the cool part about this is it's a multi center randomized, double blind, placebo controlled trial. These are like the sexiest studies, so this is why it's an awesome study. This article was published on December 14th, 2017. Right now it is December 2017, so this is brand spanking new. Uh, what I always like to say about that is whenever you watch this particular video, it might not be December 2017, so always take this into context with the information I relate to you because data changes, so always keep up with your data and watch more Journal Clubish videos because they're pretty cool. This was published in Lancet, which is one of the bigger journals. If you're not familiar with the Lancet, you should be. It has a pretty high impact factor, so it's one of the important ones. It's also a free article. I'm going to try to show you guys free articles because like that you can read it yourself. And I always encourage you to read these articles on your own and don't take my word for it because these are my interpretations and I'm not a research guy. So why is this, this study so, so, so important that I'm sharing it for you? Well, first of all, staff is everywhere, 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 and it's ubiquitous in the ICU. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of data with regards to how to treat uh, people who have staph infections. You know, if you look over the last 50 years, if you combine all the patients enrolled in staph aureus uh, treatment trials, it's less than 1,600 patients. But this particular study that I'm sharing with you today has 758 patients, which is awesome. Now, I practice in, a, in an ICU that's in the United States, um, and basically the way that we practice here, remember, this is December 2017, this is not a guideline, this is just the way we do things. Uh, we pretty much, everybody who we suspect has a staph infection, we just give them back, pretty much empirically, uh, for the first 48 hours or so until we get, you know, the cultures back, and then instead of hitting them with a nuclear missile, we kind of sniper them and just give them some napsilin or something that's going to be a little bit less nephrotoxic. But one of the cool things about this trial is I'm going to share with you is that you learn uh, kind of the practice patterns in the UK where they have different drugs than what we have here. So I like that a lot about this trial. So why, why do we use rifampin? Well, it's an oral medication, has good bioavailability in that fashion. It penetrates the tissues, penetrates the cells, it penetrates the biofilm, all those, these three components. It does it better than glycopeptides as well as beta-lactams. Therefore, in combination with these agents, with the uh, beta-lectins and glycopeptides, it is theorized that rifampin is going to be better at treating these infections than just using those agents on their own. So you might be saying to yourself, like I was saying to myself when I saw the study, hmm, rifampin, I'm pretty familiar with this medication in terms of I've heard about it before, but I don't use it a lot in clinical practice. But just, just as the key buzzword to remind you what rifampin is, that's the one that turns your saliva, your tears, your urine, your stool, it turns it this, this uh, orange color. And, and remember, this is the one that can stain the contact lenses. That's the part that's a, like a board question. So just remember those sexy terms about rifampin. As I always do, or as I always will do, I'm going to tip my hat to the people who actually wrote this study and who actually developed the study because they are awesome and uh, this, is, this is a really well done study. But why did they do this study? Well, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of mortality and morbidity associated with Staph aureus infections. And as I mentioned, Staph aureus is pretty ubiquitous these days. Now, it is said per the study that there's widespread use of rifampin in, in clinical settings, but there's no data. There's no pragmatic trial. There's, we are uncertain whether the risks outweigh the benefits, excuse me, that the benefits outweigh the risk of using rifampin in patients who have Staph aureus infections. So we, we need data, and that's what these people set out to do. So I usually don't delve in way too deep into the methods, and I'm going to go ahead and read this to you, and you can read it from the article yourself, but it is a multi-center randomized double-blind placebo control trial in adults who are greater than 18 years old who have Staph aureus, documented Staph aureus bacteremia, who had less than 96 hours of antibiotic therapy. 
So what they did after that was that they assigned patients to two groups, those who received rifampin and those who received placebo for two weeks. And then obviously they had the standard backbone of antibiotics, whether it was Nacillin or Bank or whatever they were using in the UK at that time that's listed in the study. Uh, you know, they were getting that medication as well. So all they were doing was just supplementing rifampin into the patient's regimen in one of these two groups and then they collected a bunch of data. So then one of the important things you always have to look for in these, these articles is, are, are the outcomes. And in this case, the primary outcome that they were trying to see, seek was to confirm either treatment failure, disease recurrence, or death in these patients. And they waited 12 weeks to get these primary outcomes. Now, what did they describe as treatment failure? Well, treatment failure was defined as signs and symptoms of infection 14 days after completing the course of antibiotics. That's what they define as treatment failure. What was defined as disease recurrence? Well, disease recurrence was when these patients, they had been doing better for about seven days, and then biologically they confirmed that these people had the infection with staph once again. The third primary outcome was death, and I don't think I need to define that. The secondary outcomes are far more numerous, and they include uh, time to all cause mortality, from randomization, which you know took place within the first 96 hours to two weeks after treatment. In addition to that, time to death or clinically defined treatment failure or disease recurrence within those 12 weeks. How long the bacteremia lasted was also one of these secondary outcomes. Uh, side effects were considered and other things that I'm not going to get into for the scope of this practice. These were all secondary outcomes. With regards to statistics, they did that. See the article. I'm not going to break that down for you. I don't think I'm ever going to break that down for you in one of these talks. That's not the purpose of this talk. With regards to the results, they had two groups, as I mentioned. 388 patients were in the placebo group, and 370 patients were in the, the group that got rifampin. One of the things I found interesting about this particular article was amongst their staph aureus infections, 64% of them were community acquired, uh, only 17% were nosocomial, and only 6% were MRSA. I think almost all my patients who I have in the ICU, well not all of them, but the majority of them have MRSA. So just, just a little bit of epidemiologic changes or differences between UK where the, studies, where the study was performed in 29 centers and stuff that we see here in the United States, at least in the shops where I've practiced. They found that there was no statistically significant difference in any of the composite primary or secondary outcomes. That was one of the main results of this particular study. What does that mean? Mortality wasn't different, duration of bacteremia wasn't different, development of uh, basically uh, rifampicin resistant staph aureus wasn't different, but it was associated with a small but significant reduction in bacteriologically and clinically defined disease recurrence. That's what it did notice. Of these patients in the study, for the sake of ICU, which is what I do, only 9% of the patients in the study were ICU patients. 40% of these patients have what was considered to be a deep-seated infection. And what I mean by that is, and, or what they defined as that, was people with endocarditis, uh, basically patients with intravascular devices, in addition to that, patients who have, for example, uh, intraarticular devices, osteoarticular de devices, things of these nature, 40% of these patients have these particular issues. Now, there was a hypothesis before that adding rifampicin reduces dissemination and therefore death of the staph aureus, but this was found to be false. But they did have findings that these people who had these deep-seated infections, as I mentioned, it reduces disease recurrence in these patients. But these, these effects were very modest as the authors defined it, so you have to kind of do the risk-benefit as to whether it's worth, worthwhile to add rifampicin in these patients. As I mentioned, very few patients of that group had MRSA, but they did find that there was no benefit of adding rifampicin to the patients who had MRSA versus those with placebo. So what did the authors conclude from their study? Well, I'm gonna read this to you, but adjunctive rifampicin did not improve outcomes from Staph aureus bacteremia, with the exception of a modest reduction in disease recurrence. The authors also discussed how rifampicin did not have any effect on either short-term or long-term treatment. They figured that there's no benefit to giving this over standard antibiotic treatment because of a number of issues. It complicates the management of other medications. It also creates resistance to, for example, mycobacterium tuberculosis. You know, these patients need this drug and if we have more resistance then we're going to have a problem. So how does this change my practice? First of all, 
I don't write for Ray Fabison. I've never written for it. If I have somebody with aggressive staph aureus bacteremia, I'm going to call my buddies from ID and have them come and take a look at the patient and do what they do best, which is kill bugs. But one of the things I like about this article is it allows for more academic discussion uh, with my colleagues. I like to nerd out, and as you're probably learning, I like to read a lot of papers. And it's, it's always cool to present somebody from a different specialty with some literature from their own specialty that they may or may not have been privy to, especially something as you know revolutionary. Well, not necessarily revolutionary, but it's something as important as this particular study. Um, just to say, hey, by the way, we have this patient with Staph aureus. What do you think about the arrest trial? Have you read it? And then it, it leads to some, some sort of discussion, uh, which, which I always enjoy having. But all in all, it's not really going to change my practice, but it also gives us a lot of information and insight as to how to treat patients who have Staph aureus bacteremia, and it tells us that we don't necessarily have to use rifampicin. All in all, I appreciate you guys watching this video. If you haven't subscribed yet, please go ahead and do so. Give us some thumbs up. If you have any articles that you want me to review for you and make a quick little video like this, just send me a link in the comment section below, follow me on Instagram, write to me on Twitter, let's have an academic discussion here, let's break down these articles and let's, let's just have a good time. Thanks so much for watching, this is Eddie saying bye. I almost threw up the piece out, but whatever, bye.